Hey guys, in this video we are going to be talking about the differences between SN1 and SN2 reactions. So there's a few key features that are actually usually quite easy to identify that should be able to help you figure out whether or not you're looking at an SN1 or an SN2 reaction. Okay, so the first thing is the difference in mechanism. So in the case of an SN1 reaction, what happens is that spontaneously, okay, and I mean that in the sense that there's no other reagents involved, so you may have to heat this up. But if you take iodine, which is a really good leaving group, okay, what will happen is that iodine will easily break the bond between itself and carbon, and it will take the electrons with itself. Okay, so then what you end up with is a carbocation, okay, so that's a positively charged carbon, and a nucleophile will come in, okay, so that's any Nu minus, so that could be lots of different things, such as an amine or an alkoxide, and the electrons of the nucleophile will attack that positively charged carbon, and you will form a new bond, with your nucleophile, okay? So the important thing about SN1 reactions is that they are stepwise. Okay, so on the first step you lose the iodine and in the next step you add your nucleophile. Okay, in contrast to that your SN2 reactions are concerted. Okay, and what concerted means is that basically all the arrows are moving around at the same time. Okay, so if you take something similar, okay, and you have your iodine. What will happen in this case is your nucleophile will just attack before the iodine has even left, okay? So the iodine will then break its bond and then the product of that reaction is this. Okay, so, oop, throw on my pen. And the transition state of this, okay, and by transition state, it basically means what is the highest point of energy of all of your intermediates, okay? So what it actually looks like, and it's kind of difficult to draw, okay? So what I'm trying to represent here is all those three ore groups are in the same plane. So it's completely flat, okay? And then on one side is your iodine, and on the other side is your nucleophile. So what I'm representing here by these dotted lines is that neither of these atoms or neither the nucleophile or the iodine actually have a bond to the carbon. They're kind of like half bonds each, okay? Because as you start to form this new bond, you start to break the old bond. So the intermediate is this flat molecule, okay? Basically between all your ore groups and then you have your nucleophile on one side and your iodine on the other. Okay, so that's what concerted means. So stepwise means your iodine leaves, then the nucleophile arrives. And in the case of the concerted, the nucleophile comes in as the iodine is leaving. Okay, so that's the difference in mechanism. Okay, so what factors affect SN1 and SN2 reactions differently? Okay, so first of all, if your ore group stabilizes... A positive charge it's probably going to be an SN1 reaction okay this will also mean that you increase the rate so because of the fact that you're stabilizing the positive charge this is very stable okay and because this is very stable this step will happen really fast okay so what I mean by things that stabilize um, a positive charge so benzene can stabilize a positive charge pretty well, okay? So if you have a positive charge here on this carbon, your benzene's quite good at donating electron density to it, so it's not that positive, okay? Other things that can do it are basically anything that's electron rich. So electron rich. Okay, so anything that can donate electron density like amines. Okay, however, so hydrogen is bad. Okay, 
So if or equals hydrogen, then usually you'll get SN2 reactions, okay? Or anything that's electron withdrawing is bad, okay? So if you have a load of electron withdrawing groups attached here, such as if you had a load of carbonyls, so now not that this would be a real molecule, but just to show you what I mean. Okay, so if you had three aldehydes there and you try to pull it a positive charge, that simply wouldn't exist. Okay, that's not going to want to happen because your each carbonyl is pulling electrons away from the carbon and it's already positively charged. Okay, so this is not a real molecule as far as I'm aware. I would be surprised if it ever existed. Okay, so if it's electron withdrawing or a hydrogen, for example, not the hydrogen is electron withdrawing, but it has no electrons to donate in, it's usually really bad. So if you have alkyl or aryl groups, it's good and it increases the rate. Okay. Now, if you look at SN2 reactions, they have very different needs, okay? So because of the fact that you're not forming a positive charge, it doesn't really matter if it's electron donating or withdrawing, okay? What you want is, or is small. Then you'll get an SN2 reaction, okay? Typically, okay? If H, so if it's a hydrogen, it's very good. And the reason for this, as you can imagine, so you have your ore groups that are flat like this and you have, maybe I'll, yeah, I'll continue to use my hand. Okay, so you've got your iodine over here and your nucleophile over here. Now imagine those ore groups were really, really big. Okay, so you had something like the size of my fist attached to it. That nucleophile is going to have a really, really hard time trying to get in to this carbon in the middle. Okay, so if you have something like a hydrogen, that's really, really good. Okay, other things that can be good, are anything really that's sp2 hybridized. And so what I mean by that is if you imagine a molecule that has loads of alkynes on it, okay? So let's say you've got an alkyne there, you've got an alkyne there, and then you have a hydrogen, okay? I'm sorry, that should be a dotted bond. So you can imagine now, because al you should know that alkynes are flat, okay, they're actually really, really small. So there's nothing that's actually stopping the nucleophile trying to get in, okay? So and so by that, or sorry, I should rather say sp or sp2 hybridized. And the same goes for alkenes as well, because alkenes are generally relatively small in comparison to say if you have, if or was equal to this, okay, so this is a tert butyl group. So imagine this is where your carbon is that you're trying to add your nucleophile. This is a really big group and it's going to block your nucleophile trying to attack. So small groups are really, really good. Similarly, small nucleophiles are good. So a common question that will come up based on all everything that's on this is you'll be shown two reactants. So you'll be shown, say, this molecule and a nucleophile, and you'll be asked, would you expect this to be an SN1 or an SN2 reaction? Okay, so I have some examples here to go through those. So it might be a good idea if you were to pause the video and maybe try and predict yourself whether or not it's going to be SN1 or SN2, and then explain the reason why you think that is. Okay, so if you did pause it and you've had a go, let's see if you were right. So if you look at these structures here, so you have your iodine, so that's a very good leaving group. You have to ask yourself, what does the cation look like? So the cation of this molecule will have three benzene rings around it. Okay. This is going to be pretty stable. Simply because of the fact that, as we said already, benzene is pretty good at stabilizing positive charge. All ar aromatic rings in general tend to be very good at stabilizing a positive charge. So because of that, this cation is actually pretty happy to exist. Okay. The other thing you need to think about is, well, is an SN2 possible? So if you imagine, so this is going to be pretty hard to drive. So this is your carbon here. Okay. 
So you have one benzene ring sticking out the top. There's one benzene ring kind of going out towards the back. And they can't all twist so that they're flat. OK, because they'll start blocking all of each other. So you kind of get a propeller like structure. OK, so then if you have your iodine here. Now, your nucleophile is also really big because, as I said, a tert butyl group is very large. So if your O minus is trying to come in, you've got this really bulky tert butyl trying to come in with all these phenyl rings around. So you're not going to get an SN2 reaction. OK, there's too much bulkiness going on. And because of the fact that the carbocation is stable, it's actually quite easy for an SN1 reaction to occur. OK. Now, if you look at the one down below, as always, the first thing I like to do is, well, let's have a look at what the carbocation would look like. So if you had an SN1 reaction, what you would end up with is this. OK, so there are two hydrogens and a carbon. OK, so there's a benzene in the molecule, but it's too far away to actually help with that positive charge. OK, so what you should hopefully be able to see straight away then is that this carbocation is very unstable. OK, primary cations tend to be quite unstable in general, so it's very rare you will see them undergo an SN1 reaction. The other thing to think about is that if you were to draw the uh, SN2 transition state, so you have your chlorine over here. OK, you've got your alkyl group over there, so you've got your benzene and then you have a hydrogen here and then a hydrogen sticking out towards the back. So now if you take your nucleophile, which is this propargyl or alkynyl alcohol. OK, so as I said, alkynes are actually pretty small. They're they're um, not very big groups at all. So you have your O minus. That's quite small the rest of the molecule and then you have two hydrogens and then this benzene which isn't necessarily small but it's actually kind of far away because of this small little CH2 that's getting a further away. So it's actually very easy for that O minus to come in and attack and the chlorine to leave. So in this case it's going to be an SN2 reaction. So whenever you're asked to figure out whether or not it's SN1 or SN2 you want to look at the sterics. Okay so this is whether or not are your molecules big or are your molecules small? OK, is there a lot going on around that carbon or is there only a little bit going on around the carbon? And then the second thing is the cation stability. OK, and this is whether or not do you have groups around your carbocation, OK, that are going to stabilize the positive charge? OK, so there's a general trend. So if you have a primary, a secondary or a tertiary cation, OK, and I'll draw random examples. So if you take this carbon base group here, so it doesn't really matter what everything else is. If you have a positive charge here, OK, this is kind of the same as before when you're talking about amines, you're talking about how many atoms that are not hydrogen are attached to this carbon. OK, so this carbon has two hydrogens and it has one carbon. So because there's one carbon, it's primary. In the case of a secondary one, so we'll take a similar structure and draw a positive charge here. So this is a CH3 now, OK? So in this case, you have two carbons attached to your positively charged cation. So it's secondary. And then I'm just going to scoot this down a little bit down here for space. And in the case of a tertiary cation, hopefully it's obvious enough now, you will have no hydrogens. You will just have carbon base groups. OK, so what this means, and as I said, alkyl groups or carbon base groups are usually quite good at stabilizing a positive charge. OK, so an alkane, even though it doesn't have lone pairs or anything like that, it's still, relatively speaking, electron rich. OK, so because of that. Primary um, carbocations are unstable. So you're going to get an SN2 reaction. OK, but in addition to the fact that the cation is unstable is that there is low sterics, OK, low steric effects. So this means that it's not very busy. There's not a lot going on, so it's very easy for the nucleophile to get in. 
In the case of secondary uh, carbocations or secondary um, electrophiles, and you're worried about is it SN1 or SN2, there is generally less sterics and it's a bit stable. So in the case of a secondary group, so if you have a secondary halide, such as, I'll draw it over here, um, Okay, I'll do this for all of them just to make sure it's clear where you're getting these from. So, in the case of a secondary cation, it really depends on what's going on around the molecule, okay? Because if you were to draw it like this, or, or, H, and iodine. It really depends on what ore is, okay? Because ore could just be a methyl group, which is actually pretty small, or it could be something absolutely massive like a tert butyl group, or it could be a really big polysaccharide attached to the other side, okay? So with this one, with secondary uh, cations or secondary halides, it can be SN2 or SN1. It can actually be either of them and it depends on the individual molecule itself whether or not it's going to go by SN1 or SN2 and in some cases both can actually occur at the same time. So unless you did a lot of um, mechanistic investigation you wouldn't even necessarily know whether or not it's SN1 or SN2. There's one way that's actually easy enough to tell and I'll go into that in a minute and it's really really important. So in the case of tertiary uh, carbocations they're usually very stable. Okay, they're stable and there's lots of sterics. So because of that, you nearly always get SN1 reactions if you have a tri-substituted halide, okay? Or if you're forming a tertiary carbocation. So that's generally how you tell whether or not you're gonna have SN1 or SN2. And of course, there's always the ambiguous ones in the middle, but usually in the case of the exam, it will be probably quite clear cut. You're either going to see a primary one or a tertiary one. We don't tend to be mean and give you questions that are deliberately confusing, but you will have to explain why. So if you're given, um, if you were given, where did I put it? This reaction here and they go, is this an SN1 or SN2? It's not enough just to say it's SN1. You have to explain why. Okay. So the very last thing to talk about in terms of SN1 and SN2 reactions is stereochemistry. So I'm not sure how much detail this is covered in your course, but I'll go through it anyway. So imagine you have a molecule that is chiral. Okay, so you have OR1, H, OR2, and your iodine. Okay, when you form your carbocation, or so if it's an SN1 reaction, Okay, and you form a carbocation. What happens is, is it's not chiral anymore at all. This molecule is planar. Okay, it's completely flat. And if it's flat, well then it can't have a wedge and a dash, it can't be a chiral carbon center. Okay, so then when you add your nucleophile, okay, it can attack from above or it can attack from the below the molecule. And what I mean is it can come from say up here and attack the molecule or it can come from underneath the paper. Oh, shake my camera again. Okay, so when that happens, you end up with a racemic molecule. And what that means is you'll have a 50% mixture where this is wedged and you'll have 50% of it where it's dashed. Okay. So that means you have both enantiomers in the reaction at the end, okay? In the case of SN2, what happens is if you started with enantiopure material, so you started with only a single enantiomer, what happens in the course of an SN2 reaction is that everything gets inverted. Okay, so as I showed you before, if you have your, so if that ore group is sticking towards us and the hydrogen is in the same plane as it going behind, and then you have your ore two down the bottom. Okay, so you have your eye over here and your nucleophile over here. 
What happens then is because the nucleophile comes in, the ore groups were originally sticking out towards the left, but when the nucleophile comes in, they go from being on the left to opening up flat, and then they collapse over onto the right. Okay. So then what you have is an inversion of your stereo center. So typically what you will see when you have an SN2 reaction would be, now let's take for example, this molecule here. Okay, so we're say our I is dashed. Okay, I'm gonna give this a pH. So if for example, you have O minus coming in, that will come in and attack from the opposite side of the iodine. Okay, so then the product instead of being wedged, is going to be dashed. Okay, so that's a really important feature of SN2 reactions. So SN2 equals inversion of stereocenter. And in the case of SN1, you get racemization. And racemization means if you had 100% of one enantiomer at the start, when you get to the product, you have a 50-50 mixture of both enantiomers. Okay, so they're really important features of SN1 and SN2 reactions. So again, this video is quite long, simply because the fact that I wanted to actually just get a move on and start doing uh, example questions and past paper type questions. Um, so... I hope that this was informative and also easy to understand. Okay, so the important things to remember is that SN2 gives you inversion, SN1 gives you racemization, and then also being able to identify what is good for an SN1 reaction and what is good for an SN2 reaction. So from this point on, unless you have a specific request where you'd like me to cover a topic I haven't already, then I'm going to start doing some example questions. So if you have any type of questions, perhaps you have uh, past paper questions that you found difficult and you haven't been able to do, feel free to email me those questions and then I will happily make a video for you. So remember that all of these videos are made for Cystic Fibrosis Ireland. I have a GoFundMe in the description down below. So please do check that out and consider donating if you can. Thanks very much, guys.